Um, well, I'm going to first. I'm going to ask you a question, David, which is, being that the most of the room seems to be songwriters of some some sort, what do you look for in a songwriter when you when you're going through piles of MP3, what piles of CDs that just used to be your MP3s or whatever? What is it that sticks out to you? What are you really looking for in a writer that, that attracts your attention? Um, for the level of stuff that I'm looking to do, which is obviously placements with pop acts in most countries, let's, let's get it straight here. Most of what we're talking about is pop. We're not talking triple J, we're talking about getting songs on records that will one day end up on Two Day FM if it's not Australian. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, it's about, yeah, it, it's absolutely no holds barred, go for the Joe Yellow. So what I'm looking for is something, and I a long conversation with somebody about this. Um, I want to hear a, a written and recorded hit single, which you are then prepared to give to somebody else. And I want it to sound like that. I want it to sound like, if not close to being a finished record, something that could easily be turned into a finished record, which is a very, very high thing and scares the hell out of most people because that's, that's what, it, in, in our universe, a demo is 95% of the way towards being a finished record. So that's that. There's a misconception goes around that you know, it's it's you know you can do a, an acoustic guitar and a vocal, and that's a demo. It's not. It used to be. It used to be, but even a long, long time ago. And in Nashville, you can still get away with it, but that's about it. Um, I, I was actually going to say, do you, do you want to play a, a tune? Of a demo, a typical demo for you, or yeah, I've, I've got one. I'll, I'll play a minute, and you play a minute, and we'll go from there. This is a song written at the Albert's Camp back in February, and it's by Stuart Crichton, who's actually here, um, a great, great writer called Amy Prohl, who just got signed to Columbia in Los Angeles, which is fantastic, and. Um, Let's, let's preface this for a minute. Right, so, okay. so is this was done at the camp? Is this a one-day demo? This is a one. This is a, this is a more or less a one-day demo. Okay. So this is a one-day demo, and this is what would be maybe this is what would be submitted to a label yeah. to have a to have someone record yeah. it, or maybe you want Stuart to go back in and gussy yeah. it up. Yeah, I mean, this is essentially they started at ten, and I think by about nine at night, this is what they had.
but for, for example, and, and that I represent the other writer that Onzo wrote that with, or did until recently. Um, we all love that song. We think that's an amazing smash, but that song's been around for a year and a half, and although it's been demoed a few times, it hasn't come out yet. No. So, uh, you know, even a song that a lot of people internally thinks is amazing and is produced like that, and that makes the rounds of people kind of, it needs to be so good to make it, and we're talking about the UK and the US market, it is so difficult to get things on record. There is a large amount of politics that come into play, but it also just has to be that amazing. Undeniable, <laughs> undeniable is a word that's turned around a lot, where everybody listens to it and just going, that one there. What, there's, a, there's something that happened, again, when Sweden sort of really came into the whole pop game, really, in the late 90s with, I mean, essentially, the Britney Spears record, Hit Me Baby One More Time, was the start, I think, probably the starting gun for the Swedish scene exploding. And there was a period there where Swedish writers were just getting songs onto records and records. Then about three years in, I think, all the managers in, the, in Britain and America suddenly went, why is our artist not in these songs? And that's where you had a whole, uh, to, correct me if I'm wrong with this, but it's like, that's when you had what I saw as a new direction, whereas all the pop acts before would just take songs. Suddenly it was like, no, no, my writer needs to, my artist needs to be in the room. Now, in some cases, there were obviously some talented artists who could write, but in many cases, I think there's probably been a few where they may be not so talented as songwriters, and, you know, along the lines of, yeah, let's write about love. And the songwriters around me going, yeah, love, great, that's good. Just go off and make the coffee. Um, and that's probably being a little harsh, but I think there's certain, um, I'm hearing stories back like that. What, what do you think about, uh, that's certainly what I think happened in the UK and the US, and still, to a large extent, probably 90% of what's going on in the UK and the US markets is people like you writing directly with the artist. Yeah, it's a big difference today than it was a few years ago, or especially 10 years ago, but most artists today are, as we were talking about earlier, are artists and not acts, you know, which I think is a good thing, and, uh, and so they contribute a lot more in the songwriting and uh, have their own, sometimes own, own songs, their own song ideas that you can help them tweak, so it's been more, you know, sometimes we write together, but... Uh, I like that development of the artists, the signed artists today are much more songwriter, artists, the, the whole package, which I think it should be. So it obviously it was great 10 years ago when you could write the songs and the artists perform, but there are a few of those left, obviously, you know, Jennifer Lopez and a few of those pop yeah. icons that still don't write me still though. She can write me, yeah. Right. But, uh, Carly, no yeah. one. But, uh, yeah, so it is a big difference, but I, I, I enjoy that more when the artist is, is it becomes what the, either the band or the artist wants, wants to do. And uh, it's so much more important that you believe what the artist is singing today. Can I, can I circle back to something? Sure. Um, so the, first we talked about what are you looking for. And, and I was wondering, because you've had, you've actually had sort of four stages in your life in, in terms of affiliation. Do you remember why Kent and Cosmos wanted, what did they say to you? What did they recognize in you that they thought was special to bring you in? And then what did Anders Bege recognize in you to bring you over to Merlin? And why did Max Martin want to work with you? And then ultimately, why did you want to go solo? What I'm looking for, whereas I'm asking you, what you know, what are you looking for? And what did they see in you? What, do you? what do you think you bring to the table that all these very successful producer writers have sort of, you know, it singled you out and said, you know, come over here and be with us. Yeah, you remember those conversations? Yeah, it's definitely, and it's, it's about, uh, I've always been very interested in the technical side, so I started as a teenager, yeah, I bought my synthesizers and I started mixing <coughs> stuff in, uh, in an old Macintosh, and you try to make things sound, sound really good. And I, I was 18 or 19, I think, when uh, they asked me to mix, where I asked, can I mix one of your productions? Because I thought the mix was not good. But he's, yeah, he was, at the time, Kai was a big mix engineer in Sweden. Um, so I spent the whole night till six in the morning and I did my own mix of it. And 
they suddenly went, wow, this is sounding much better than the, so I had to mix the whole album. Uh, but I was just assisting engineering in the session, and that happened. But, so I started actually on the kind of technical side, and that's where I got a lot of attention, because I was just playing really loud and making things sound the way I think they should sound. So and then I got to use the studio from like midnight to six in the morning to do my own stuff. So that was the kind of deal I had for two years. And so I think that they saw some kind of quality in audio engineering, I guess. And then I started to do some tracks that some people liked. And then I thought the chorus was OK. So I had a, my own chorus melody that I thought was better. And that's how I trained. And I was lucky to team up with people that could see, OK, this is great. Let's, you should work on this thing. You know, this is. Now, was that, was that at Cosmos? Or which period? That was when I went to Merlin. And I, I had. I wrote songs, but they were like not complete. There were good parts in them, and but I always felt that was the key to have people around you that could see that and and uh, can make you better, actually. So I, I was fortunate with that. And I'd just like to say, on that note, how many people here co-write on a regular basis? Okay, with the same people or with different people all the time? All right. Okay. The one thing I think was noticeable about, for me about the Swedish scene was everybody wrote with everybody the whole time. People, I'd be talking to someone, they'd go, you know, you'd be introducing people, people would already know each other, and the output of songs that I, I mean, I was lucky I had a, a roster, a good sort of 20 strong roster of people who would just write, or predominantly write in front of people, but every time the song came in, I don't think I saw a 100% written song by one person in like eight or nine years there. Um, it was all co-written. And usually, and again, this is, if, if we're dumbing down a bit, excuse us, but you'll find often that there will be two to three people in any team. And you will find that there are teams where there's somebody who's particularly strong in production, but obviously very musical. Um, you'll tend to find the people who are doing the bit on top is generally referred to as top lining. Uh, and that will which is melody and lyric. Which is melody and lyric. And you will find sometimes there'll be somebody who's a bit more skewed towards lyrics or somebody who's a bit more skewed towards melodies. Um, yeah, yeah, jump in any time. Yeah, well, I think there's this kind of Swedish mentality that we, I mean, we're obviously not very indivi individual. You know, we, we're not, we like to work in a group of people. And uh, I think as an artist, that's not always a good thing. And we always looked at Australia as like, they're great artists, but where are, where are the hit writers? Yeah. You know, it's like so much talent in the, on the artist side from Australia. But we always looked at it like, wonder where where is all the writers? There's so much music, and where are all the songs? And uh, nowhere to put the songs because yeah. there's no pop here. I mean, some strange. I mean, just to background, obviously Triple J's dominance came at a time when commercial radio here kind of went for gold format. So you ended up. Triple J sort of took that taste making thing. So Australia's actually, as a, Australian music has skewed very alternative here, which I'm, I'm from that background, I kind of love it, but at the same time, I'm dealing with pop. And I think, is there anybody here who considers themselves working with pop? Okay, but you probably find it really hard as an artist, right? Because there's almost nowhere to go unless they're on a TV show, that's it. Now, the beauty of that is you can harness all of that stuff. There's a whole world out there, let's ignore the UK and the US, there's a whole world out there that wants pop. You know, a Triple J is not the be all and end all. In fact, it's probably the antithesis of it. If you look at Australia's music export over the last 12 to 13 years, it's actually insanely jagged. I mean, we've, there was Savage Garden, what, 98, a few rock bands like Wolf Mother, who still sound like you're right here. Um, and you've got Go Chandu now. And I mean, all, honestly, with a couple of indie things in the middle, that's it. That's actually not very good for a country that is now the sixth biggest music market on the planet. And that's the other thing to remember. Australia is the sixth biggest music market on the planet now. A long way behind number five, which is France. Do you know what the number one is? USA, right? Number two? Japan. And by that much, well, we'll come back to questions in a bit, but by that much. And do you know what percentage of the Japanese market is domestic? 
80%. And of that 80%, there's an awful lot of them who don't write songs. An awful lot of them. Sorry, I said a lot of what? A lot of, awful lot of Japanese artists who don't write songs. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would say the majority <laughs> don't write songs. Um, that's a market. Are they English songs? Are they... They are, they are, we'll come into the detail, but essentially what they will do is they'll take a song in English, do a Japanese version of it, uh, they will cre essentially create a new copyright, and they'll run with that. Uh, and these are, in some cases, these are songs that sell, you know, records that sell physical CDs that cost more than a CD in Australia. Think about that. Anyway, yeah, I mean, they'll be, the, uh, the Japanese market will run $21, $22 US for one CD, and your royalties are doubled, and, you know, and they still buy, they, they package everything in such ways that they'll have limited edition great photographs and books and things, so like the real fans go out and they buy this stuff. You can, you can sell 300000 in a week if you're on one of the really big records over there, and you've doubled your royalties, so it's the equivalent of doing 600000 It's great. And they have, they have translators as well. Yeah. Certain record labels have their kind of favorite translators, so they get, I have a couple of songs that, you know, you get suddenly the translated lyric, so you, you can definitely write English songs, you know, with English words. Absolutely. And which often turn up in the final version anyway, in apparently random ways. You know, there'll be, you know, think of the top ten English words that anybody who doesn't speak English would know. Those songs turn up in, in the Japanese songs with the most regularity. Yeah, it, it'll say, I love you, and then I'll go into a bunch of things, and then there'll be some la la la's, and then it loves you again. <laughs> and then there's a lot of Japanese in it. But it's quite um, interesting. Uh, but it's it's Japan's very open. It, if you know the people and you figure out how to get in there, they love a great pop song. They just do. And it's usually major, and and the chorus has to really pop out. You know, they're, they're they don't like linear. It's what what I think you really need to do when we're talking about these foreign markets. You need to really do your research. And you need to figure out what's working there because what's working there doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily the thing that works at home. When I was doing, when I was working with Ellie Reed, it was in a, in a period where it was like um, uh, Crazy in Love with Beyonce was blowing up, and we had Yeah with Usher, and we had all this stuff going on. And what happened there was the cadence became the hook in the song, like the melodic hook kind of disappeared and took a background to sort of the cadence and the feel of, of what it was. That never really took off in Japan. It sort of never worked. So it was, you know, I had these great songwriters who had massive hits selling millions of records and I couldn't get arrested with them in Japan. And I had these other guys that at that time in the US everyone would kind of go, oh, it's a little schmaltzy, yeah, it's all this, like too pretty. Japan would take those all day long. Yeah. And, and, and we'd made a lot of money. Sure. And I mean the truth is the whole um, you know the whole American urban R and we thing got very much about the track was in many cases the hook. Yeah, the track. You know, and you know it wasn't it wasn't a big Melody. And frankly, a lot of that stuff didn't even sell anywhere else. I mean, now, obviously, Australian commercial radio is totally dominated by that stuff. If you go back five or six years, there was a lot of that stuff, what we'll say pre-Gaga, which was kind of melodically under the radar. It was, it was, it was not very accessible. Uh, and I think there was, there was notice of a lot of the urban stuff, of the real hardcore stuff, wasn't traveling outside of the US at all. Um, uh, so I think that's where we've discovered and I think for most of us, I think when I first, I think I got my first cup in Japan about 2001 or two, and had to deal with the fact that they were going, we want an equal share of the song for the lyric, and I was kind of going, no, because I was used to giving, you know, maybe 10 or 15 percent to an adapter at that point, and there was this kind of face-off, and they said, we really love the song. I was going, yeah, we're not doing it, and they're going, but they really, really love the song. And eventually I spoke to a couple of, you know, they were still kind of new at the, the whole thing, and, I spoke to a couple of them and said, just do it. I was going, all right. And they, they recorded it like within days. And it came out and it did like 450,000. I was going, I should have known this all, all along. And it was, it was from then on, it was just like, you know, it, chucking them out there. I mean, you know, there's, between all of us, we probably had, you know, not from one of records out in Japan. And, you know, you're now starting to see Japanese writers who are not just lyricists. I think you're starting to see a few Japanese track people, a few others who are obviously getting, they're looking at their market being overrun by, um, 
by uh, in, you know, foreign songs. Now, this is the other thing, of course, is you know, getting an Australian song recorded by an Australian pop artist is really difficult because they tend to prefer the international writers. But the reality is, you guys are international writers as long as you're not pitching to Australia. <laughs> and believe me, there is a mystique about a song coming from another place. I don't know if that's true. Being totally you know, true. And I mean, frankly, when I moved from Sweden to here, I didn't tell anybody I moved. I was, I was, you know, I was sending songs in Sweden. I spent two days in Hong Kong. I sent a couple of songs from there. I hit the ground here. I was sending songs. People had no idea where they were coming from. You know, they presumed they were still coming from Sweden. I was sending Australian songs. I was sending. It's all over the place. You know, the new Co Kelly Clarkson record, the single, is you know written by Alex Derricus out of out of you know out of Hamburg. Who's actually now lives in LA, but I mean, you know, that's a German. You know, there's us, the Germans. Yeah, and the Jurgen had a strike. Yeah. And so it was Sweden. Yeah, Sweden prior to that. Well, exactly. The, Swede, I mean, the Swedes got it very, very. I mean, I think the Sweden happened through a number of very specific events, but what the Swedes were very good at, and it was, it was, you know, they had a, a bit of a history, and I think what was interesting is, is as much as the writers were brilliant, you also had publishers. And this was a, a very, very solid. The publishers drove this. This is how I learned publishing. It's like, and uh, all the publishers are in the other conference about how to get cuts in Asia, which is one of the great ironies of this. But anyway, um, um, we, uh, I, you know, you discovered quite early on that all my colleagues were going, just go to the guy who's making the record. Don't trust your sub-publisher. Your sub-publisher, I mean, essentially I was taught although it was never quite said, your sub publishes a nice person who takes you out to dinner and who you tell what cuts you've got them in their territory. Uh, I was given a laptop. Now, let, let's break it. We're, we're yes. going to do like one-on-one, your sub publisher. So, I, so David, it's a publishing company here. I have a publishing company in America. I come into this territory, and there's Sony, and there's Eli, and there's Universal, and there's Alberts, and there's you know, Native Tongue. There's all these companies. I do a deal with a local company to represent my songwriters and my people for Australia. That's called your sub-publisher. So in a perfect world, they're supposed to take my writers and make make sure they're on Australian records or whatever, but they also collect my money here and do those kinds of things. Yeah. So that's what he's really talking about. In most cases, sub-publishers really don't do much for you. They take you to dinner once a year and get you drunk, and that's right. Um, and you hope they do something great. And sometimes they do. And it, there's a reason they don't. It's, you know, once upon a time, the sub-publisher got 50%. Uh, now they get very, very, very small percentages. So if they've got a local writer, where they're getting, I don't know, maybe 30, you know, where they're keeping 30% and they're looking at sub published somewhere they're maybe going to get, I don't know, 20%. Yeah, cover this one. That's a reality, but the truth is this is a particularly difficult market because of the small amount of pop that's here anyway. But generally speaking, the Swedish thing was very much, and I think this was partly to do with people like Pedro Liddell, who was my predecessor at, at Chrysalis when I was there, who actually signed Antor to, to, to Merlin. I think, or was it Arne? And Baga signed you. Yeah, Pedro came in and, and uh, kind of built the publishing yeah. side. Yeah, that. and I mean, Pedro was great. Pedro was great, but Pedro used to be, you know, play drums in a band that was signed in the States. He knew people. You know, I'd been in a band in England. I knew people. You know, I was bumping into a and people who'd been scouting my band 14 years previously. Because um, a lot of those guys just don't go away. Uh, and what's interesting is there are a few other people, I think, in, in Sweden as well, who actually had been in bands. I think uh, Billy, Billy Hansen, I think he was in a band in the States as well. There's a few of these had those contacts. So they just kind of went, you know, what do we do? We'll go and go to the people we know. Some the, the, the luck that came up, there's, you know, I remember they were ringing me and kind of going, we just got a cut with, Christina, ah, and I'm going, that's great. I don't know who that is. This, I don't know either. It's some Hispanic girl signed by Ron Fair, and I'm going, oh, that's great. And we were talking for months about this Christina Gaha. Uh, and nobody can say a name. And if we could, could suddenly, Genie in a bottle. Eddie, Eddie Lara. Yeah, well, that's suddenly Genie in a bottle broke, and we're going to go, Christina Galera. Oh, yeah. And it's literally, this was six months, before, maybe three to four months. This was a CD sent by a thing called Tip Sheet to the a &R guy. That's what we call the good old days, because that doesn't happen very often <laughs> these days. And which brings us to the DIY element or not of this. And Arthur might have a few views on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the days of, you know, sending a CD or, or an MP3 and hope to get lucky, you know, it's if you're trying to, 
to get songs placed is obviously uh, doesn't happen a lot uh, today. Um, I think I notice a lot with the, the, the personal relationships are so much more important today um, because of everything is you know the, the music scene is smaller but still it's it's bigger than ever but it's uh, so I've been traveling more to the territory I want to work in so if I want to work in the UK I, I go to London I try to see people uh, and physically play music and build a relationship and it's of course it's very difficult if you're in Australia to travel <laughs> so far away but personal meetings and the, and the relationships have been, been crucial for me for the last few years. And I'm guessing particularly in the UK and the US, right? It's particularly there. And, yeah. uh, I, I will say this though, and I, I'm sure you've probably found this as well. I live in Los Angeles now. I just unfortunately moved there from New York after many years, and I hate to admit it. But it's true. This is what's happening. And, and Los Angeles, where I have many friends and where the company I I used to work for was based, so I've been there four or five times a year, every year since I, I moved to New York many years ago. Um, it is flake central. I think, you know, since I moved to Los Angeles, I called up people I've known for years that I see every time I go to LA, and I was like, I just moved to town, let's have dinner next week. And they're like, great. And so we set up like, I had like six meetings my first or second week. Four of them canceled, one to reschedule. They do that, but there's something special about being the guy who's in from Sweden for only a week. Can you see me? We're in from Australia. We just happen to be in. We're, we've had a couple of cuts in Australia. Would you take 15 minutes out of your schedule to come by? Sure. And people, it, there's something special about being from elsewhere and locking those meetings down and, and doing it. When you're like just the guy across the street that we can kind of do anything with any time, it sort of loses that change. So, it is much more difficult to pitch from here, but if you are taking trips, or if your collaborator is going, but you happen to know a guy, use all those relationships, use all those networks. Go like, oh, I have a cousin who's in the business, you know, he works in the mail room at Warner Brothers Records in Los Angeles, and you're my co-writer, so you should look him up, and maybe, those guys, it's weird, but stuff like that, you get results out of stuff like that. It's all about networking, it's all about pushing out, and there is something special about being from you're also very lucky in the sense that you're in an English-speaking territory. So the, if you do pop a big one, the opportunity for that to go worldwide, to go the UK, to go to the US, to go to Canada, to all that, is great. Like that's, that's an amazing advantage that you have over the guy who's sitting in Germany, or although Germany is a great market, but you know, someone sitting in Zimbabwe is not, nearly as lucky as you guys are when it comes to sort of infiltrating the, the worldwide market. Um, I think the other thing, that I'm, I'm just to follow on from that, there's two things. As Anto said, he goes to London, he goes to New York, he goes to Los Angeles, particularly, look, you know, between New York and Los Angeles, the, the, the weight, you know, when I first started, it was like, I went there in actually September 8th, 2001, which is astounding the amount of time, but anyway, uh, New York was where it was happening. And you know, I can, but I can also remember going there and, and going, yeah, Sweden's over. For example, that was that was kind of one of my first American meetings. Sweden's over. Um, the guy now works with me for all the time. Anyway. Um, the uh, it's now moved very much to LA. But again, the th I think the mantra I'm trying to put here a bit is the UK and the US is fine if you can get the break. But the breaks are very. You know, we actually sat down before this this writing camp we did, and I sat down with a consultant from LA and from London, we sat down and we looked at all the briefs that come out, and there's an awful lot of information comes out, and we actually went through and we go, all right, what's real here? What is an actual song pitch rather than you need to write with the artist? And I think we came down to maybe 30 projects of worth in the States where you might genuinely be able to pitch a song. And I think we, I, we barely cracked 10 out of the UK. That was what we got to, and then we were kind of going, but then there's everywhere else. Now, is anybody here just, I just want to touch on the whole Asian thing. We've obviously talked about it a bit. Does anybody watch S SBS Pop Asia? All right, does anybody know what it is? Apart from the three people who put their hands up? Right, Sunday mornings, sit down and watch it. At the <coughs> yeah, well, at the, moment, at the moment, Korea is one of the big music export powerhouses. Uh, ANZ Stadium, uh, 
Uh, anybody go out there in November to the K-pop extravaganza? There were over 20,000 kids to see 10 acts that I guarantee most people in the room here have never heard of. And I'm kind of going, wow, 20,000 kids to see bands that nobody are getting no mainstream radio play or TV play. There's one digital radio station, one SBS station, which, by the way, is their second biggest rating program after the news. So there's a whole cult there. Imagine that times 10 throughout the whole Asian region, including Japan, which is, as we've learned, the second biggest market in the world. Now, the Koreans are killing it. Absolutely. Yeah, if, you, if you break out of Korea, you're big, in China, you're big in Japan straight away. You're big in China, which also makes you big in Taiwan, makes you big in Singapore, makes you big in the entire region. So K-pop, when you said Korea, it's like, you're right that being a Korean artist is great, but the Korea as a market itself is not in, in, in the ballpark. And to, I mean, to be honest, I, this week I had an email from a guy out in New York kind of going, we need you know, a K-pop song, and I chucked in a few things that I was involved in. Uh, and I'm going, what's the movie for? And they're going, it's for the newborn movie, um, which I was kind of going, ah, oh, that's good. Uh, at the same time, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting emails from a guy who's, you know, doing a story on K-pop for the New Yorker going, can you introduce me? Um, when the New Yorker starts to do stories on Korean pop acts, <laughs> something's about, well, it may not happen, but it's, it's probably about that. Billboard.com, so Billboard are a big, you know, US music magazine. It's, it lists, it's got a tab, the K-pop chart on the main, it's like album charts, country charts, urban charts, K-pop chart. And that's only popped up in the last year, so it's, it's incredible. It's really, you look at these videos of these bands you've never heard of, and it's like YouTube, 50 million views, 60 million views, and you look at Beyonce and she's at 20. I mean, we kind of like, okay, they're real fans, they're hardcore over there. And this is before you, you start going on to things that aren't YouTube, like you, you, yeah, to do you and all and all the, 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 the Chinese ones, where you know triple those figures. That they launch an InSync and or Spice Girls like every six months. There's like a new one, and they just keep going and going. And that's top, like if you get a song or two on those, it's tons of revenue. All right, and then you want to pop. I was just, I was just going to say very quickly one other thing. You're probably asked, wondering how the hell we do, do we do this if you're not doing it yourself you're probably doing it through a publisher or some sort of agent. Or a manager. Or a manager. And at the moment, I've, and again, this is with all due respect to my colleagues here, there's almost nobody in this country doing it. So if you're looking, except for me, um, if you're looking, well, you know, that's why I'm here. Um, if there's, but there are people around, if you're ever dealing with people, make sure that you actually find out what their genuine track record is. The words hold and cut, these are two very different things. Hold is, a theoretical granting that you do to allow somebody to record your song for the first time. A cut is when the thing's actually recorded on a CD or on iTunes, it's out. People go, yeah, we've got lots and lots of holes. It's like, it's great. And you know, I, you know it's, it's, but it's talk. A cut is a cut, a hold is a fantasy until it, you know, there's an old saying from Nashville, it ain't final till it's final. If I, could actually, if I could actually come up with a decent digital equivalent of that, I would. But um, anyway, uh, probably have time for questions. And one, one, one quick thing that I want to add. Like you did, there, there are Stuart Frightens and Rob Conlins and those kind of people in this country. Absolutely. And there are people who have international experience or are getting international cuts. If you can be their second engineer, if you can volunteer to sweep the studio once a week, do it. Yeah. Like get, just get, you know, there is Alberts, there are these two people. Like, yeah, just get around it because that's how, that's your end. And that's just like, the other work thing, your way up the yeah, work I was, I was just gonna say, the other, the other native English speaking thing is that there are an awful lot of people who do tracks who want people to actually write a melody and lyric to those tracks. Yeah, that, um, is, that is the, you're golden if you can do that because it's yeah. the hardest thing to find. There are a million track guys involved. Yeah, yeah. But if you can do hit melodies and hit lyrics and, and hooks, you can work for years on it. You will also find that there's a lot of very, very good track people coming out of non-English speaking territories. And the, some of the better UK and US people are so oversubscribed that frankly they're a little slot snobby. They've had some success, they may be not as hungry as you guys. You guys have the same basic qualities that a British or an American writer has to be able to bring you know, a clever lyric and melody to the table rather than just you know, the sweets and I've got to love them. They will do a good lyric. Rarely do I hear an astounding 
and I mean, I mean this in a nice, positive way, it's sort of an astounding, deeper, multifaceted lyric. And I, I know Aunt Anders Bago, for example, would write some great lines, uh, but somebody having a conversation with him, kind of going, he, he, he writes great lines, he just doesn't necessarily always know which ones they are. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, which I think is, like, I mean, you know, you know, I, you know I, I speak Danish and Swedish and believe me, the idea that I would have to write a lyric in either of those two languages, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, well, and, you know, and the Swedes, who are brilliant at melody, they were all, you know, we were, when I was working with Merlin, I was their representative in the, in the States, which is how we became friends or working together. And they always wanted UK and, and Americans to come over to write their yeah. always. All, and, and as he says, you're in that, you're just as strong as it's English is your first language. So. But you're hungrier. And you're also, the one thing that getting tracks from abroad doesn't, you don't need to get them in an airplane anyway. You just need to be able to write a great melody with the lyric and put it on that track. Yeah. I think it's a lot about seeing, you know, your own strengths. What, what am I, what do people think, what do I think I'm good at? And then trying to put the pieces together, you know, let's, I think that's what we did in Sweden, what we, you know, one guy who was incredible at programming, and then I could do the drums, and when, then we wrote the melodies, and then we brought someone in who was going, I can, I can beat that verse. You, you, the chord is great, but the verse is not right. Let me give me, let me get a, you know, give it, give it a shot. So it's a lot of that uh, to open up collaboration because I see a lot of people sitting on the road, and even in bands, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm writing the songs, I'm doing this. And, yeah, can you, we were talking earlier, can you talk about the sort of what you see in America and England when they write a song and it's done, what we were talking about, and what you're talking about right now? Yeah, it's a lot of, I see a lot in different places, because uh, I'm raised in that songwriting culture where you can, you kind of craft it until you feel it's right, and it could be, it could take two days, it could take a week or a month, and suddenly the song is done. But, um, so... But you'll go back to it. You yeah, go back to old songs. Yeah, we revisit it. You know, sometimes you leave it for a week and then you go back. And sometimes someone else comes in and, and gets a better idea or changes something. And but I see a lot, and, and especially I've, I've been working in New York now for six months, and a lot of writers come in, co-write, and they kind of write it, and that's it, and then on to the next one and on. So you have kind of twenty songs that are okay instead of grabbing that great idea and actually crafting it till it's perfect. So you're actually, it takes longer, but you're saving a lot of time. That's true. So because, because you'll have a great verse, but you'll miss the chorus. So you'll have yeah. a great middle eight, and you'll miss and it. And to me, it's like, I, I've never understood that way of writing. I just, I understand the artistic side of, of, you write the song, and you get it out of your system, and it's, this is the song, and maybe it's great, maybe it's not, but it's, uh, to me, it's also almost like a, you have that responsibility to make sure if you're gonna do it, do it, as good as you can and challenge every part of the song. And sometimes those little changes, you know, like I was saying, I Kissed the Girl with, with Katy Perry was actually, that chorus was made because of a little tweak. Uh, Max Martin got the whole song on an MP3 from Kathy Dennis and Dr. Luke. And, and but the chorus wasn't the, the same melody, but he just changed the first two lines of the melody. And it's, that made it a single and one of the biggest just a minor change, otherwise that song would just be one one of the other songs that never, you know, make it. And it's, it's a pity sometimes, because I hear a lot of great ideas and great songs, and but it's like a throwaway a lot. So I think that's a culture to kind of really nurture it and, and get it right. Yep. Do you have that? I think the question, yeah. Um, are you, you've been dying there. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, just an idea about the comments relation to the Australian market, um, where do you see country rock, adult contemporary country rock music, that's what I do, and also what is the opportunities in Asia, you talk about Asia for that, is there a future in that genre in the Asia market? Not really, um, I think I think adult, contem adult contemporary, depending on what you call adult contemporary, you know. So if you're thinking like, um, take a Keith Urban style, country, uh, country flavoured rock pop. You've got a tough fight there because, uh, frankly, Nashville itself, if, we, if that's what we're talking about, is as closed a scene as I've ever seen. When they say, you'll come back now, you hear what they actually mean is, you go off with a song we just wrote and get it cut somewhere else that's not here. Uh, that's probably being a little harsh, but I think that's kind of... But there, there is something... 
Coming from an American perspective, and I've just had, I've just set, set up two writing trips for my American writers to go to Nashville, but you know, one's from New York, in very New York, very not Nashville, and one, one is a guy who just co-wrote the Jason Mraz single, and it's, he's 55, and it's his first cut in his life, and you know, his wife dances in the corner while they co-write the songs, which leads to, don't have your boyfriend or wife go dance in the corner when you're working with big writers for the first time. It's a really bad idea. Just, um, just throwing that out there. That being said, there's this weird thing between Australia and Nashville. There is. I don't know what it, it goes back to Olivia Newton John, I guess. But they seem to, they love you guys down there. And they're, the doors are more open to you there than LA or New York. But I, think, I don't know what that is, but that thing that does exist. But I would say for you to do it, and again, the two British writers I've known who've actually made what I call genuine, genuine inroads into Nashville has been Steve Robson and Don Maskell. Frankly, both of them had Nashville managers as well as British managers. They would spend at least six months a year there, and I think it took, I think certainly Don Maskell got his first couple with um, um, Rascal Flats, I think it was four to five years after he did his first trip there, and he was spending maybe half a year every year from a Robson about the same. Um, hey, your name needs to get known within the community. Yeah. You need to get trusted, and the good will needs to sort of go around. So it's doable, but it's it's uh, that's your easiest way, and it's I won't say it's the only market that exists. There are funny little pockets of country rock in Ireland and Norway, bizarrely enough, uh, Switzerland, places like that. But I mean, I honestly, know. yeah. But I mean, on here, yeah, sure. But I mean, you know, there's no it, it, no real money there. You're actually <laughs> South Africa. If you could, if it's bizarrely, songs in Afrikaans, country rock, that love it. Um, for, that, that was the radio edit. Make sure, <laughs> make sure, no, make sure next to no money. Uh, but it kind of, you can, it, I mean, there is a, a certain thing about being able to say, I have a cut here, I have a cut there. And you would believe the number of writers out of the States have said, man, I got a cut in South Africa. I'm going, yeah, I know. And I got it for you, and I'm kind of embarrassed. And they go, no, it's great. I'm going, yeah, you want to be see your royalty check, and, you know, which, you know, it, but it's still, it's a thing. And again, the Australian scene, with a, a few notable exceptions, you know, I've got quite a few Australian songs out into the international market. Not many, I've only been here three years. The writing has been, just getting that whole level up has been, people don't write songs to, uh, you know, produce them up to a high level, so I haven't had a lot to work with. But it's possible. It is absolutely possible, and getting those runs on board uh, is partly what it's about, because that's when you, the Americans kind of go, wow, this person you know, has 10 cuts already, I'll put them with my writer that's kind of on the way up in Los Angeles when you happen to be there. And that's how suddenly you end up with that song that just happens to go bang, sometimes. Uh, red top. Thanks, Loudly. No idea. Kids music? Oh, well, kids. Yeah. Aren't they one and the same? Uh, yeah. If you listen, if you listen to K-pop, yeah, just put an urban beat on it, and you actually might not be that far off. Uh, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. There's Korean. The Koreans have this conceptual idea. All the things that you consider to be the case about um, credibility and music. That doesn't make sense. Forget all that stuff. You know, there's a Japanese act called AKB48 who actually have 48 members, and they are actually now have an Indonesian version, which also has 48 members. Well, Super Junior started that whole trend. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. Like yeah. Whatever. They, they do. They essentially franchise the the, 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 the concept as well. So, uh, yeah, the gun hat in the back. Um, so for the best way to go.
I mean, I don't think most publishers won't sign somebody unless they've got what, what we call pipeline income, which is essentially you've got a few runs on the board. There's some money because sadly, if you give if you give them an advance, they've got to write it off immediately, and that looks red on the books, and that's a bad thing. Um, well, it's also our job is parlaying your career, right? So I've heard, yes, yes, we do do that. But you know, you're you're sitting in exactly the right, uh, assuming it works like it does in the states. You're sitting in exactly the right area, because what we want to hear is we want to hear from someone that we trust that you're good, because we're so busy dealing with the people we have signed. Like maybe ten percent of our job is looking for new stuff. Most of the time, it's like. I'm dealing with Encore, he's sending me three new songs a week, and then it's like I have to figure out where to place these songs or who I can put the room with him, and oh, and now all of a sudden, like, but who do I trust? I, sort of the, the first credible in is an organization like APRA. It, it's somebody like, you know, Millie would call me up and say, oh my God, there's this great new writer, got a great batch of songs, blah, 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 you know, and that's, and that, then I'll stop and sort of take some time. Or another publisher will say, I love this guy, but, I'm, I've got too much on my plate, and I can't sign him. You should take a look at him. Or Anthor goes in and writes a song with you. It, you know, it could it could be some co-writer that I trust who says you should check this, this new guy. It's really good. And, and there we have the whole thing with co-writing. The people that I've worked with so far here, who were essential, because the few writer producers who are actually signed here, you know, they're fighting very very hard, predominantly in the Australian market, and they you know in the way they're quite established. There's not a lot of their stuff going outside. There's a bunch of writers who, for whatever reason, have chosen not to do publishing deals. And they're co-writing with other people. And I'm, when I first came back, I started to hear about people almost immediately. They figured out who I was. They were co-writing with other people. And there's a girl called Amber Shepherd who I've probably got, you know, almost 10 cuts for. She's also suddenly being hailed by, you know, DCM magazine as, you know, the floor, the, the, you know, the voice of the dance floor, in, in, you know, internationally. And she's done a combination of the pop thing and the dance thing, and has actually got herself to a point now where you know there's a lot of people looking at her. Um, and I heard her about it through you know a guy who played you know extra guitar in the church, and said you should you know I, I don't do this but you should check her out. That's how it happens. And it's because she was writing with a bunch of people who were already in the game or yeah they were in the game, and she was starting to be in the game as well. So again. If you're going there with a bunch of songs you've just written yourself on your own to front people, it's probably not going to happen. The co this is, again, where the co-writing thing helps is your name will get out because you're co-writing with people who go, man, this guy or girl is astounding. Um, and to go back to your original point, I have found traditionally it's easier. It's still difficult, really difficult. But I found it's easier to infiltrate through management than trying to go to your A&R departments because they're as jaded as change. It's all already starting in Europe. I mean, the United States is pretty new, but I know that they, they are changing the whole way. It's not going to work to do like that for, for a long time. But uh, it's been out in Europe for, for a couple of years now. It, it, it's great because it's so easy to discover, discover new things and 
you know, the, from a user point of view, it's it's great. It is great. But, but, but they, they've set it up in a way, and they've gotten it through the laws, so it's streaming. It's not, you know, a download. You're supposed to be able to you download it. You can play it whenever you want. You can put it on a playlist. You can do whatever you want with it, and that you're supposed to pay more for. Streaming is supposed to be like a radio. You turn it on, and you just listen to whatever happens to come through. Well, <laughs> Spotify, you can play whatever you want, when you want, playlist it. it it's, it's exactly like a download, basically, except for it doesn't sit on your computer, and yet they've gotten away with paying a much smaller royalty. So, it, it, yeah. But this is the future. I mean, this, this is going to be the access against ownership thing, which is going to be the big question for all of us in the future. What we're talking here, we're talking in a validly old, old model game, which will change with... Sure. With, the, with, with the future. We've got <coughs> pressure. I think one, one last question. Um, and uh, I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, no, actually, no, I haven't done the left side of the room. Thank you. Um, how can I make sure that you hear my music? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, break into my home. Tiny to the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the tiny is the bed thing. I just want to be Yeah, no, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Uh, um, I, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, the point is, I'll probably hear about if you're seriously involved in this in this market. I'll hear about you. And I mean, I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, you know, I'm not about to be run over by. Well, David, here. Mike Taylor said that my songs were pretty good, so I'd like to think that if he thinks they're all right, maybe I can get them through. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I'll say very, very quickly, look to your left and right. Do you know the person sitting next to you? Yeah, and they're amazing too. All right, all right, then go beyond them and talk to some other people beyond you. Everybody in here should come out of here with two potential co-writes after this. Talk to the people either side of you that you don't know and actually try and arrange a co-write and see if you can do it. It may be a train wreck. It could be astounding. Yeah, but, and to hit your point right there, like Mike Taylor's one of my close friends. We go back a million years, we do the Bali camp together. If Mike Taylor, if you were coming to the States and Mike Taylor said, this person's really good and you should put her in the room with somebody, I'd do it in a second. Like, almost without hearing show. I'd obviously listen to it to go, okay, stylistically do this and this, but that's, that's how deep the relationships kind of go with certain people. I completely trust Mike Taylor's and I'll be, I'll be honest, I will listen to most things, even though I've got to go off to the States in about three days, but I'm, I'm, my business model is finding writers who don't have a deal and doing single song stuff with them because, frankly, I have no money. Uh, that's how I'm, well, I'm trying to create a scene where I won't say there's no scene, but there's not much of a scene. And, you know, there, there, there's no reason why there can't be a scene here. Uh, you've just got to do it. So, God, I'm going to regret this. So bombard me. We <laughs> had to read that. Yeah. Oh man! <laughs> I, th I think we've got we've got to knock it on the head. Well, we've got time for one more. One more. Uh, you do it. You do it. Me. I promise you. What do you got? You just told the room. Anyone care? Ah, uh -huh, there we go. So you do this finals thing a lot, huh? I haven't made the winner yet. Okay, but you're doing you're doing all the right things. You're entering like you're in these things, and you're. I would say just songwriting contest generally skew a little bit sort of touchy feely sing songwritering uh, for what I do, and I won't say it's an irrelevance, but for me pitching pop songs to pop acts. It could, if there's a great song there, it can probably be turned into something I can use. But generally speaking, what I hear out of those competitions is, and again, this is a wild generalization, are things that I can't use because they're usually done like a singer-songwriter. They sing a songwriter by right. definition. Right. 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 Songs, that's why they call them singer-songwriter. What's in the top ten this week? Okay, I, by the way, I just looked at the top ten. I'm jet lagged, so I woke up at 4.30 this morning and checked Billboard out because I was bored and I had done all my emails. So, um, I was kind of excited for what we do, not necessarily what we always listen to or love, but you know, the top ten in the U.S. is all popular. All popular. Totally. They're like 
for years there was R&B, and there was, it's like, you know, it's One Direction, it's The Wanted, it's oh, Nicki Minaj, it, or it's uh, Nicki Minaj, it's Gautier, Gautier, that means everything. But it's like, it's all really, into, like, it's a great time to be a, and with all the TV shows, it's an amazing time to be a pop star, whatever pop is. It's an amazing time. There are so many opportunities, so many more opportunities than there were 15 years ago to place pop songs with people who just sing. You know, there's the voice, there's you know, I, I mean, we did a, we, we, did, I mean, we had the biggest challenge the, the other week because Alvis, we put together a big, we did a five day writing camp uh, because the voice, obviously, if you've been watching it, has one of the front runners sounds like Janis Joplin in 1967. And you're going, Dan, I don't have anything like this. And what we did is we got a whole bunch of songwriters. I now have an album's worth of stuff that sounded like it was recorded in Memphis in 1967. Um, and you know, with a bit of luck, we'll end up with the first single. Uh, you know, there's other things. You know, what do you do for an act that comes out and sings a song, a Piaf song? That's her, st her, her starting point. Where do you go with that? That's not the sort of thing the average music publisher has. You know what? You know, here we go. I have that song. Those things, that's an interesting thing. What's interesting here is that there are so many writers, I think, from an organic background who aren't used to doing this, and a few who are used to doing the pop thing. Putting the organic writers together, and in some cases, people way out of their comfort zone. Tom Wolfe and Papa vs. Pre stuck in together with Amanda Brown, ex go betweens, and Adrian Deutsch, who was in the Red Rose. Damn! They wrote the killer indie pop song from hell. Uh, you know, Meg Washington, who's like lovely, but you know, she's a diva and a half. And you know, I mean that in the nicest possible way. She's an artist, but you kind of go, you know, put it together with, you know, some Brian Kennedy who's done, you know, Chris Brown and, you know, uh, and Rihanna. And astounding stuff comes out of it. Yeah, this, is, this is what's interesting about Australia is there's so, pe so few people who are from that, what I'd call the very, very routine pop direction. If, if things go even a little organic, the time may be here. Um, yes. Nada. First thing people hear is the voice. The voice is wrong. Remember, most A&R people, 30 years ago, most A&R people came from, from a music background. From the mid-80s onwards, most people came from a marketing background. And it doesn't mean they're deaf. They can hear a perfectly presented song and go, that sounds like a hit to me. If you come with a rough demo of a potential hit, they can't hear it in there. That's what's happened. And there's a few people, and I would say Peter Carpenter is doing the voices, one of the old school. He can hear Ross Fraser, who does you know, X Factor. He can also do it, but they're like, probably, I won't say they're the only two in the country because that's probably doing some people a disservice. But, you know, on the planet, mm -hmm. we're talking handfuls of people who can still do that. And frankly, once they get to the artist, the artist's going, eh, it doesn't sound like me. Yeah. You know, try yeah. playing a country song to a 17 year old black kid who grew up on urban and see how far you get. Doesn't happen. Hey, hey, but there's also the flip side of that, which is, which is more rare. But when you get a great demo singer and then you present it to Britney, yeah. it was like, oh, she can't pull that off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing like that. But, but equally, you know, somebody like Paulini, who most of you know, like, you know, Paulini writes, and Paulini's actually had quite a few cuts for other people. And you know what? Paulini in the room on a song? It's like, I've got some less than astounding songs cut. Because people go, damn, what a great song. And what they're actually saying is, what a great damn, what a great voice. Yeah. And then they record and they're kind of going, it doesn't sound as good as the demo, which is, believe me, our dilemma constantly. All of our dilemmas <laughs> constantly is often that the demos sound better than the final recordings. Sadly, do you have anything that you'd like to close with? Well, that was definitely the, the demo thing. I can't emphasize enough how it doesn't really matter what style of music you're doing. It's, uh, uh, you have to, you, there is no imagination anymore, uh, you know, if you're trying to, you know, make people listen. And, I mean, uh, we used to be able to do kind of rough demos, but now, I mean, you spend a week on the, on the production and, and mix it, and 
that's when you send it out. And I re-demoed songs many times, maybe two or three times with the vo new vocalist, because it's just, it doesn't sell the song right. And sometimes it's like, we need a male vocal on this, because it's gonna just make it sit, sit better. And so it's a lot of, I, I think it's so worth it to spend that time and effort to just make it. And right. I'll say here, time more than ever. That's why writing with somebody who has production chops is extremely important. And honestly, for that person who's going, eh, but I have to do the demo. It's like, when the production gig comes along, you'll probably get to do the production as well. And I'd say, you know, I've done an awful lot of, even if it's files deals with Korea or Japan or Spain or whatever the hell it is, there's a few thousand dollars there for, you know, and I'm talking the, the, the small markets now, there's still money there to be, to be made for having done the effort of maybe great, making a great demo. So it's not a waste of time. Sometimes you don't, but often you do. Because they have two choices. They can get the guy who made the song that sounds astounding, or they can get some poor schmuck down the road to try and do an exact copy. What would you do? And it's going to cost them the same amount of money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And on that note, I think we're going to leave it because this man in the red t shirt is looking really angry about us. Uh, thank you very much.